I actually um, approved, edited, and wrote the foreword to Ruth's first book before I met her. Uh, we'd had quite a bit of correspondence. I thought her first book was groundbreaking and very special. And, uh, uh, but we hadn't met at that time. We met at a party at an APA meeting after that. And that was, must have been about 84. Yeah, 83, 4. 83, 4. And uh, since then, her career has skyrocketed with half a dozen books and another book on the way, just about in press, I guess, called uh, Beyond Concepts. And uh, uh, Ruth is a real original in a field which has not had enough originals for many years. Thank you, Dan. Oh. Uh, the title of this is Perception as Translation, with a question mark. Do you can you see what is invisible? And I'm going to talk about a way of thinking about perception that I accidentally fell into <coughs> when I was writing about information and about cognition. Because I've actually never all written on perception directly before. So. But I slowly came to realize as I was working that the way that I was thinking was not at all standard and that it seemed to have some novel and interesting consequences. I'm very unsure how sound this way of thinking is, and I definitely could use some help. So I'm just going to tell you about it and see what your reaction is. So the central idea is that the move from sensory input to first recognition of distal affairs of the world, that is, processing that is prior to propositional inference or to the recognition of affordances, but that prior processing is not a prior kind of inference Say a special, say inference that a special model has been thought by some, but instead translation or a series of translations. It's a translation from the information carrying signs that are impacts of structured energies on the perceptual surfaces into inner representations of states of affairs or of affordances. All right, first I should say what I mean by an information carrying sign. I'm interested in a kind of sign that I term, I call it an info sign, info, info, info for information, info sign. Paradigm cases are natural signs. They carry what I am calling natural information. So I'm just going to give you an example of one. Consider a child who's got a spotty rash, and we say that it might be a sign of measles, or it might be a sign of scarlet fever or it might just be a sign of allergy. The doctor looks at the rash and says, the rash is probably a sign of measles, but it might be a sign of scarlet fever or just an allergy. Perhaps we'd better take a culture. So the rash then is a sign of one, or is, it, is, is a sign of another. But the sign vehicle, the rash just by itself, does not indicate one it is a sign of. An interpreter may have to add context or, and other redundant signs, or consider contrary signs, to interpret this sign. And there's always the possibility of error in reading info signs. The error, of course, will be on the part of the interpreter, because there's no such thing as a false or mistaken info sign. Natural signs don't lie. All right. So I was thinking of the structured energies that impact on sensory surfaces as being info signs sharp light gradients that activate edge detectors and erosion may be signs of object edges or signs of curved surfaces or they might be edges of occluding objects or edges of color patches or edges of shadows. The hue of light may be a sign of a reflectance or of the, of the reflectance of a surface, maybe this sign of the angle of the surface to the eye or of the texture or of the light source or of any combination of those. Giving an example of redundancy, depth, for instance, is indicated at least by accommodation, convergence, by binocular para parallax, by binocular movement parallax, by haze, and by occlusion. All right, so I was thinking of these structured energy patterns as signs. I saw the process that leads to recognizing to the recognition of affairs in the distal world through the senses 
as a process of, tra of translation, a process of translating from natural signs that impinge on the outer senses into inner representations of what these signify. All right, what do I mean when I say that I'm trying to understand what goes on in perception? Excuse me, Ruth? Think, yeah. Uh, first, let me apologize. I got carried away, and we should have had a coffee break now. Have what? Before. No, not yet? Not yet. I'm still confused. Okay. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. All right. Um, All right, I've got to tell you by uh, what I'm discussing. All right, so I'm, I, I want to apologize first to Dan Lloyd for not letting, we should have had the question session there, and uh, I screwed up there, and now I've screwed up by inter interrupting your talk. Um, so carry on, and we'll have the coffee break after your talk, okay. with my apologies. <laughs> All right, so I was thinking of the structured energy patterns that, that hit your outer senses as signs. And I saw that process, the process of recognition of affairs in the distant world through the senses, as a process of translation. All right, what, what do I mean by perception? The end result of perception, as I'm understanding it, and I should say that this is merely a matter of terminology. This is not an analysis of the perception or something. But. The end result of perception, as I'm understanding it, is not a phenomenal experience, for instance, uh, which, incidentally, a phenomenal experience is something that I take to be a theoretical entity postulated by a false theory. <laughs> Along with that, right. But the end result, instead, is a representation of a distal world, which might be in belief or recognition of an affordance that occurs prior that occurs prior to any kind of immediate inference, or prior to prior to inference involving people would say concepts. I don't, I don't concepts either, but that's <laughs> that's another matter. All right, I don't take this representation in, say, phenomenal experience. The end result of a correct perception then is a pure observational or perceptual, pure observational knowledge or perceptual, a perceptual knowledge or. or uh, as I say, knowledge of performance. If we're thinking of perception as reading info signs, as I have described them, this would typically require sensitivity to probabilities given context, attention to what would make sense, for example, to what would be coherent geometrically, or, the, or what would be thought possible, and so on. It would involve heavy use of pattern completion, is actually an important kind of sign reading. It would also involve the use of redundancy, surely, multiple signs of the same thing. And it would need to resolve to involve trial and error at various levels to find out what makes sense of the whole. So of course I'm remembering here of oh, the huge number of descending neural pathways and sensory cortex. All right, so what difference with this way of thinking about perception? Right. Well, first, let me contrast it with one that's very well known, the classical theory. If we compare it with the kind of way that Helmholtz and then David Marr were working on visual perception, they understood the process of vision as an inference from properties of the pattern of light striking on the retina to its immediate causes in the surface from which it was reflected. This was considered to be a form of abductive inference or inference to a hypothesis, hypothesis, something like backwards inference from effect to cause. Contemporary attempts using Bayesian inference are similar in taking vision to be recovery of the immediate causes of the light patterns that hit the eye. Marr took the aim of vision, what he called the computational problem that vision had to solve. He took this problem to be the reconstruction of the three-dimensional layout of surfaces that are reflecting light to the eye. So that would be recovery of shape, size, texture, reflectance, angle from the eye, and that's about it. Um, he said that from that information, everything else that vision can tell you could be derived by ordinary inference. But in line with that, it's been taken to be obvious by pretty much everyone that vision can only reveal the identity of what the light has just bounced off of. 
and more generally, perception has been thought to reveal very proximal causes of sensory disturbances. It's often assumed that for each of the senses, as a matter of fact, there is but one perceptual object or property, one level, at least, of perception, one ontological level that is actually perceived. Just what this level is, for example, is a matter of controversy, a strong controversy in the case of audition. People have argued about whether you hear sounds or whether you hear activities that make sounds, and there have been other suggestions as well. Our supporting idea here has been a strong tendency to want perception to be relatively reliable. There is resistance to the idea that when constrictly speaking, hear that a door has slammed shut or that it was raining on the roof. This because the sounds that carry these bits of information could have been caused in other ways. So it could be wrong. The most proximal causes of perception and the ones you are most certain to be right about, right about do tend to go together, however. Hence the focus on, and this is another reason for the focus on what is proximal, the assumption that whatever you can see has to be sort of the very first uh, cause, the very first cause of your vision. So, so that's comparison. So what difference then does making perception, thinking of perception to translation make? All right, so we're thinking of perception as what happens between the pitter-patter on the sensory surfaces and one's first recognition of what patterns mean. What kinds of things can you see that or hear that or feel that or smell that directly without inference? All right, first difference, first change would be that thinking of perception as translation makes that we could have the possibility that perceptual error is quite common. The incorrect reading of signs it should, not be, not, should not be an unusual thing. So I thought I heard someone at the door, but apparently it was the wind rattling the screen door. It's generally accepted that there is such a thing as persistent perceptual error. Why should there not be such a thing as transient perceptual error? Then we might fallibly hear that the engine is missing on a cylinder or hear that it's raining, or hear that the wind is strong, or hear that someone is at the door, but all of these would be fallible. Right? All right, second, perception could proceed in layers. If perception is the reading of signs, there might be reading of the sign of a sign, then reading of the sign which has been signified as a sign. And this could occur all on the level of perception. So, for instance, a ringing bell sound is a sign of a doorbell, is a sign that the doorbell button was depressed, is a sign that someone's at the door, um, which might be a design, might be a sign given the time of day that the postman has arrived. If I then discover, however, that it was really a short circuit, <laughs> I may no longer hear it as someone at the door. Or we might see that the sun is shining by looking at the wall. The light on the wall being, of course, a sign of the sun being out. So we would normally say, I, see, can you, I can see the sun is out. If we can get the other wall. All right, I'll come back. I'll come back to these seeing the signs of signs in a minute. All right, third. There are lots of kinds of signs besides signs that are causes. Here are some examples. Causes can be signs of their effects, or of the effects, or of effects of the same cause. So, it's a classic sign of thunder. That's a sign of an effect. Similarly, outfielders can see where the ball will land. Right? They see a sign. A sign of the, the, what they, what signed is future. It's obviously an effect, not a cause. Parts of any commonly repeated pattern can be signs of any other part of the pattern. So that the elephant has an elephant-like nose in front is a good sign that it has an elephant-like tail in the back. <coughs> that the cherry is red may be a sign that it's ripe. A strong lemon smell may be a sign that something yellow is near. So here are some other kinds of signs. Traveling north on Wormerhill Road, Passing a small lake on your right, 
is a sign that our house is about to come up next. The name of the cabin we are building, that, it's, that it measures equal diagonals, is a sign that the corners are properly square. Hearing oh say, can you see, uh, is a sign that you will hear by the dawn's early light. A sign, an info sign, rests merely on a correlation between two states of affairs with a dis within a discernible re reference class or domain. Right. And a correlation can be between any two kinds of things. It doesn't have to be a visible thing. A visible thing. It could be between any two kinds of things. There are very few values. <coughs> if perception is sign reading, then we have no reason to postulate that the various sense organs each have a proprietary kind of perceptual object. So, we might hear vocal tract gestures, as exclaimed by some who study speech. We might see that Johnny is angry. We might see that the poker is hot. We might see that it will be warmer over there where the sun is. We might see that something is slimy or slippery or soft. We might see that the cookies are just about to burn. We might see, this is interesting, we might see that the time is 3.30. Time visible. <laughs> see that the time is 3.30. <laughs> by looking at, at the clock. Or we might see that the temperature is 50 degrees by looking at the thermometer. All right, returning now to my second point, that perceptual processing is basically the reading of signs Perception might include the reading of signs of signs, signs of signs of signs. All right, consider again the bell sound as a sound of the doorbell ringing, and that is a sign of someone at the door, and that is a sign given the time of the day that the postman is here. I hear that the postman is at the door. Perhaps I can see that my daughter is home by her shoes in the hallway. Perhaps I can see that you have been to the barber's or that you have been to the grocery by the grocery bags you are carrying in. Someone says, particularly interesting, I think it's when we realize that speech, the language, is of course a sign. So when you hear language, first you hear a sign, and then you have to understand what the sign, what, you hear the sign, and then you have to understand what the sign means, right? So you have to kind of interpret a sign of a sign. Um, so what? Someone says it's raining, say, what ruffles your ears are signs of local vocal tract gestures. Those are signs of beliefs, and those are signs of world affairs. Do I hear them that it is raining when you say it's raining? Do I hear that it's raining? Is that one way that it's raining can sound? Is understanding language perhaps a perceptual process? Is understanding language really just a different kind of perception? Direct perception. Is understanding but not believing, like seeming to see, but not believing. All right, last, if any of the above were true, perceptual learning would be a lifetime process. You would keep changing your perceptual abilities all your life. Different people would be able to perceive different things. For instance, can perceive musical fifths and fourths as such. Various things under a microscope can be seen by some people and others not. Some people can see cracked bones in an x-ray, or they can see where through, through a laparoscope, or they can see where a raccoon rat by the, walked by the stream last night. Accordingly, experience and memory would have to be tied to perception in a much more intimate way than has usually been assumed. Ruth, again, I apologize for, for the interruption. And now let me ask you a question about something you said just before the interruption, uh, which I uh, think I missed. Contrasted um, what you wanted to say about info signs with Helmholtz and with Bayesian approaches. Uh, yeah. And I don't understand the, that bit, and that matters to me a lot. So tell me. 
Um, she needs the money. The helmet's approach. The mighty. You gotta use the money. Oh. The, the, the helm holds approach, or the um, David Moore's approach. Um, they assume that what you're trying to do is to infer from an effect back to the cause, and that you're going to, that the only, as far as you could infer, really would be a very, the very direct cause. So, what's really interesting about the notion that what you're trying to do is read signs. As a sign can be a sign of something else in any modality. I mean, you know. And um, well, well, another thing, another thing I think that that, that is quite quite different there is. I mean, if, if if my reading of info signs are right, info signs are things that you have to know the context um, in, order, in order to interpret them correctly. You have to balance them against other signs. It's not really as automatic a kind of process as you get this. First of all, you're getting away from the microphone again. I don't know if people in the back can hear. So please, sorry about that. Um, I don't see that, <laughs> seems to be my theme today, a sharp line. <laughs> it seems to me that um, uh, the distinction between seeing something as an info sign and just seeing it as uh, uh, information to update your priors, uh, they come. They come to the sort of the same thing. It's just how sophisticated. If you see it as, yeah, well, how, if, because if it all it depends on what you've got in your priors. Yeah, if, if you have a lot of information, if you, if you if you're fluent in French, that's part of the. Damn it. Yeah, where's the, where's the table saw when you need it? <laughs> I don't know how to make that thing. Um, if, um, oh, this is terrible. Ah. Take it away. <laughs> Take it away. Um, if, um, uh, if you're fluent in French, then a bit of French uh, a French sentence, il bleu, uh, will, in a, in a Bayesian model, will tell you it's raining. You, 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 will, you will infer that, and is that a, is that a Helmholtzian, uh, uh, or is that a Marian backwards uh, going from effect to cause? I mean, it's a little weird to say that, that among the, uh, you know, that you interpret from this auditory event that it was caused by it's raining yeah. <laughs> by it's raining at the time but in fact given where you are and who you're talking to what happened what, what am i missing uh, uh well maybe i'm missing um some of what goes on in the modern bayesian attempt at trying to understand um but um what I'm really interested in countering is the idea that, that really every sense has a, um, a very proximal area that it's trying to interpret. I mean, I'm, I mean really clear here is something like David Marr saying that the only things we're trying to figure out is what the, what the basic layout is, what the reflectances are, what the shapes are, you know, et cetera. That's going to be the end of, that's going to be the end of vision. And the other people say, and all we ever hear, I mean, other people, all we ever hear are sounds. This has been strongly argued, right? Um, whereas, you see, if you, if you take this position, then you can see that a sign could be a sign of any depth. As a matter of fact, if I say that perhaps perception, perhaps understanding language can be perception. You can be understanding things at any distance of any kind through your ears. It would be simply a, a that would be a straightforward perception. So I don't know what well you want to, uh, yeah. uh, I, I think that a David Marr defender could say, um, yeah, you get to the three D sketch, and that's you could say we'll call that perception. What you draw further from that once you've got that three D sketch, um, we won't call that perception. We'll call that inference. And if you want to blur that line, which I think you do, fine. I'm yeah, up no, with you yeah, there. Yeah. No, all right. So what I have to do, 
and what I have done elsewhere, but I didn't hear, is to talk very carefully about what the difference is between inference and translation. Um, and particularly between translation and mediate inference. So the claim, the claim really, the, the claim that I'd really like to make is that translation, first of all, is not inference. But second, that if it were inference, even if you try to model it as inference, it would be, it would have to be modeled as immediate inference, whereas the kind of inference that one needs to go beyond, you know, for, for David Morris, say, to go beyond his, what he gets from perception would have to be immediate inference. It would have to be conceptual inference, immediate inference. But, uh, I mean, uh, moving from a sign, seeing that as a sign of a sign, you know, moving out like this, doesn't require inference. Um, all it requires is uh, sensitivity to probabilities, which will trigger, trigger a reading. That's very different from a premise. So, you know, okay. so th this is what allows inf um, inference to be deep. That, yeah. I, I understand better what you mean by inference now. Too. Yeah. Thank you. So, other questions? Two. <laughs> <laughs> I, let's see if I can formulate this. I used to think that uh, think of perception as translation yeah. 30 years ago, yeah. and I gave it up. Yeah. And the reason I gave it up was that, at least in the ordinary understanding of the word translation, it's between two languages and you're preserving meaning. Now, in the case of perception, you're taking, let's, if we're, if we're looking at perception that involves two modalities, let's say seeing and feeling, okay. okay? You have to use the kinds of cues that come to the eyes. Those are, um, you know, cues from distribution of light. And eventually, and you have to use cues for the haptic sense of pressure and whatever it is on the hands. At some point, they, those have to converge on a common representation, or you have to translate between those two kinds of input, however you want to put it, so that you know that the thing that you're touching is the same shape as the thing you're seeing. Um, but I, can, I have a hard time thinking of those processes. At, I th you're confusing the multi, multi-modality kinds of thinking with the pure modality kinds of thinking, where you're just trying to take those patterns of light or those patterns of pressure and make some sense of them. Eventually, you're trying to converge on something that can cut across modalities, like object, the notion of object, um, and also something that you can talk about, namely an object that's out there in the world that you say, that object out there. Um, it's also, it's not a translation from language to vision. It's a, it's a coming together in a common representation. I, yeah, I think that, well, the problem, problem here partly is that one needs to sit down and talk about the notion of inference, which is not often very well, very clearly talked about. The notion of translation, and I don't know what your notion of coming together is, but that would be a third notion. Figure out what the relation among these are. Other questions? All right, here, Nancy, go. So I'm not sure I'm getting this enough yeah, yeah. in this comment, but okay. I'll make it anyway. It seems to me there are two ideas in, in here that that are things that might be empirically tractable. Yeah. Um, with you know psychological stuff. So so one is the idea that perception is not just a matter of seeing simple features and object identities and locations of things, but a deeper interpretation. And that's all all of that stuff imbues your percept. And I think that's yeah, exactly and, and right. this this takes you know that, that interpretation is to that uh, uh, you know, in, interpretation, reading, under, is, is different. It's a different kind of thing completely from inference. I mean, th this, this I need to claim. And uh, so where people have normally thought, well, from now on, you've got to make inferences and bring in, you know, I want to say no from now on. You've got to bring in context, which is going to change your priors, maybe. But uh, you don't have to bring in a second premise in order to in order to find a sign 
Find a, through a sign, you find another sign. The sign is in a context such that it reads as another sign. And that this could all happen without inference. Okay. A couple of months ago, Ned, Ned Block gave a talk at Emerson about work he's working on with perception and different levels of perception and the philosophical implications of that. At the end of the talk, I asked him if he believes his work bolsters Frank Jackson's knowledge argument. He said it does. Do you think your work bolsters Frank Jackson's knowledge argument? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> no, I don't know what it is. Uh, actually, uh, notice that Frank's knowledge argument also is concerned with um, someone who doesn't expect the phenomenology that would be. You know, I, am, I, I don't take representation to be in the phenomenology. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm not interested in trying to derive it, you know, more. In a way, the whole point. If I say you can see that someone is angry, well, can you see angry? Can you see anger? Well, because you know what's interesting. I say, no, well, no. You can only see what light falls on. That makes sense, but, but can you see that someone is angry? Well, I want to say, as a matter of fact, you can perceive that if perception is merely translation, translation, translation. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I wanted to ask you whether you are familiar with Nico Orlandi's recent work. She has a book entitled Nico Orlandi. She's a philosopher working in perception at UC Santa Cruz, I think. And she has a recent... Uh, so, so, so she has a book called The Innocent Eye, which came two years ago, I think. And in the book, she claims that uh, Bayesian models of vision are basically more computational level descriptions of a process which is embedded into the neural structures over an evolutionary scale. And I think this is a kind of view which you could endorse, because Helmholtz actually believed that interpretation is inference. And you seem to be strongly opposed to inference in the sense that Mar understood it as manipulation of some kind of internal vehicles and so on. So I thought that this view that Orlandi sports, the one that she endorses, where she thinks that basic models of vision are really just redescriptions of uh, the way that the perceptual system is biased. Yeah, th well, that's just the impression that I had. That's just the impression that I had. As a matter of fact, I, I had a half a sentence there, but I, but I, I have to admit that I don't understand well enough the details of what goes on in, in the Bayesian reconstruction to take a stand. I'm, okay. I'm not usually. But <laughs> you might be interested I'm, in I'm checking really not out in that book. I'm just sort of putting, getting my, wetting, wetting my toes a little bit here. <laughs> All right. I fell into this <laughs> working on some completely different things. <laughs> so. Other questions? I just had a quick one. Um, I was wondering if you could perhaps draw the distinction between your concept of info signs and kind of the older concept of affordances by Gibson. Uh, oh, are they, yeah. is, is, are affordances yeah. a subset Excellent of question. info signs or info signs yeah. subset yeah. of? Well, if, if, you know, do you want Kip Gibson or do you want Michael Turvey or do you want <laughs> Even the way you think best. Yeah, it's not, not, not clear exactly whether all these people agree. Um, the, there is one thing that's very similar. I, I think a, one way of thinking about the invariances that Gibson is interested in is to think that he's exactly thinking that the light should be, you should simply be able to translate the light. But that, because they're, they're going to be uh, one to one correspondence. So it's so so in a way, yes. I I I, I myself. Well, this is well, I live with the Gibsonians. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is this is Gibsonian. Um, on the other hand, their notion of information and the way they spell it out, and their uh, well, the word representation is an anathema <laughs> to these people. So there are various ways in which I can't put it in Gibsonians, but 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 there is something very similar there. Yes, I think their insistence that uh, 
But the, what you want, want, what you want is to find the invariances, which that approach can be picked up in action. Is what they're particularly interested. In. Yeah, nice. Time for a coffee break. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. <laughs>